pavillon, ils sont tous allumés. Euh, on va peut-être aller le prévenir, le président, qu'on va commencer pour faire asseoir les gens. Bonsoir, euh, bonsoir à tous. Bienvenue ici euh, au Welcome. Merci d'avoir répondu à l'invitation de C'est un plaisir de vous recevoir. Vous avez bravé la chaleur. Vous avez eu beaucoup de discussions, mais en tout cas, merci à ceux d'entre vous qui sont là. Nous avons eu beaucoup de discussions. C'est un lieu unique pour nous. 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 C'est un lieu unique pour nous about from the area in the territory of Sartre, so the department of Sartre. And to introduce this evening, I'm going to ask Pierre Fillon, president of the uh, Automobile Club de l'Ouest, to give you a few words of introduction. Thank you very much. Good evening to everyone. As Fabrice just said, thank you very much for coming here despite the heat wave. I think it was 41 degrees centigrade earlier on. It's a bit cooler here, though. The Welcome is not a usual place to host these conferences. We used to do it in the museum, but uh, we are um, in this room now. Now, the exhibition on art and victory was greatly successful, and that is also why we left the museum this evening to have you gathered all here with us. We've brought you a very strong symbolic element here to this uh, conference. It's this wonderful BMW 328, which uh, was brought in by ATS and Fabien Sarai. This history between art and victory is written over time, thanks to the action of passionate men who brought us the construction, the, the builder or the manufacturer of Bavaria under the, under the limelight uh, for the 24 hours. This evening, we welcome two people from racing, two heroes of the 24 Heures du Mans, Yannick Delmas and Marcel Mignot. Yannick is a member of the Hall of Fame of the 24 Hours of Mans. He, uh, he gained the fourth victory on B in a BMW on the legendary circuit of the Sartre. And Yannick is a true ambassador and champion of endurance and a faithful friend of ACO, and he works alongside us during the Endurance World Championships of the FIA. So thank you very much, Yannick, for being here with us this evening. And then we have Marcel Mignot. He's a local person in the, this step. He's a, a driver and instructor at the School of Driving, ACO School of Driving. Marcel was a competitor at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. He uh, drove a BMW. Um, with Hervé Poulain, one of the art cars, um, with one, in one of the art cars. Now, we also have Hervé Poulain, who's a, a senior auctioneer and the quickest man on earth. He imagined the concept of the art cars, and he's currently abroad, I think, on holiday, and he sends you all his warm welcomes and his passion for the uh, this conference. And I would also like to renew our thanks to the BMW Museum, to the director, Ralph Huber, and to the teams who opened their collections to us, Hervé Poulain, who loaned his art incredible art works of art, Tony Walker and François Berdeau for their two wonderful, beautiful cars. And thank you very much also to all of the team of the Heritage uh, Collection and Museum. And I'm now going to hand the floor over to a wonderful team, Marcel and uh, Mignot and Monsieur Delmas on track to open up this uh, box of souvenirs on the for the BMW 24 Hours of Le Mans. But good evening. And thank you very much, Pierre. Um, maybe you would like to go and seat yourself back in your seat with the audience 
events and we're going to start the conference. Now, we're here in the welcome room. We needed to show you this, and I'm sure that most of you have uh, seen this exhibition, but in pictures we're now going to look at this exhibition, Art and Victory, which is, of course, uh, something that makes the Museum of the 24 Hours one of the most handsome contemporary art museums in France at the moment and for the next few months. Voilà donc euh, cette exposition. So that euh, is et la victoire, a video on the exhibition Art and Victory. Euh, there are approximately 150 of us here in the museum, but we're also on live. A few thousand people are actually following this conference in France and, of course, abroad. And this is the magic of the new medium, new media. So we're now going to welcome the guests for this evening. We'll begin with the local person, the driver, instructor at the School of Driving, ACO, the man who's able to manage very quickly um, trajectories, but also able to comment on them and explain them. Ten participations in the 24 hours of the I'd like you to welcome Marcel Mignot, please. Dear Marcel, you can choose where you wish to sit. You can sit yourself. Vous êtes, vous êtes ici chez vous -même. So this is your hometown in Le Mans. Mans. You're never alone. You need two people uh, to be a team. So today we're going to set up a team. Um, we're going to welcome alongside you. He's traveled a thousand or so kilometers uh, in the great heat to come up from the south, a great uh, driver in the history of the uh, 24 hours of Le Mans, the Hall of Fame. Pierre said this. It's a very private circle. Pilots who won at least four times or more the race at the 24 Heures du Mans. He did so, but he added a panache, which was absolutely incredible. He did it with four different brands of cars because sometimes they have seri they have the same car or the same series, but he went from one manufacturer to another and he had this, these wins in Le Mans, 14 participations, and in fact he stopped uh, too soon for some of us, maybe that's what we think, because he could have hit, fought against a famous Belgian Belgian pilot in, famous in the 24 Heures du Monde, but he still had the age and the eye and the foot to do so. But he's a man of belief, Yannick Danmas, four victories at the 24 Heures du Monde, member of the Hall of Fame of the 24 Hours. 
Messieurs, vous avez des, Gentlemen, des micros you devant. have microphones just Et in front of you on the table. Pour commencer rapidement Maybe you can take them. Maybe en, you can tell us de, just to start de, and begin de, this de, evening, de, just to de, get de, things de, going de, before we move on to the de, racing de, part. Two de, small de, questions, de, very quick de, questions. De, it's very de, hot de, today. De, we de, said 40 degrees in Le Mans. Do you remember having known either one or your, either of you, uh, 24 hours, the race being uh, run, raced on with this type of heat, Marcel? Yes, I do remember in 1975. Um, this was a year when temperatures were very high. I was driving a Ferrari, and in the Ferrari, I can tell you that things were very, very hot. Yannick. Good evening to all of you, above all. Thank you very much for welcoming me here this evening, Fabrice. I'm delighted to be here. And to answer your question, I believe it was in 93, 1993, it had been quite a hot event. But I don't really remember. I think the heat was one of the elements that we had to contend with. Despite uh, the suffering in the car, we actually forgot about it because we were concentrating so hard. Yannick, you work with the ACO for the World Endurance Championships. You are, you are both, well, you aid the management team in the racing and also the, uh, the group of, of commissioners and, and auctioneers. You have your view on, you have a look at, or you have you put in your expertise. Uh, Le Mans was a couple of weeks ago. Would it have had an impact, this heat, a few weeks ago, if it had been so hot? Well, I think that if the temperature had been as hot as it is, and it has been for the past um, few days, then probably um, the uh, things would have um, suffered, even the cars. And of course, now cars do have air conditioning and the GTs and Proton have a temperature that should not, uh, they, that you could not go beyond in the inside the car. This is part of the rules and regulations. This is also for a good reason. Um, you can't um, make the pilots um, run out of puff and uh, make them too tired. It's a question of safety. A couple, maybe 20 years ago, the inside of the car could reach 55, 60 degrees or even more. Uh, today, it is no longer admissible. It, from from a security and safety point of view. But I think that the mechanical aspects probably would have suffered a lot more than uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Thank you, Yannick. So heat, there's a lot in the exhibition. We saw this earlier on in pictures. You discovered it. Did you enjoy that, this exhibition, Marcel? Yes, I did. Um, it shows very well the presence of the BMWs at the 24 Heures du Mans. I was very lucky to be able to take part three times thanks to Hervé Poulain, who came regularly from the 1970s to start training up and preparing for races that he was preparing, he prepared for himself, and he used to take part in these races. And I remember that in 1974, I was a competitor in this race, and I invited him to come to take part with Mulsan, the Mulsan team, um, not to mention them, to, to take part. And soon after, he came to see me to compare the notes on the race, and he told me that he wanted to take part in, part in this uh, event. And at the same time, he told me that his uh, he had had a great idea, and that was uh, suggesting that a manufacturer associate one of their cars in the race with the uh, work of a contemporary artist, which was an extraordinary idea. And we saw this following with the marketing exhibition of the brand that just shows its cars, and, and there's a lot of demand for this in the 1970s. Now, Marcel, we're not going to talk about that too much. I know that you are a very good instructor pilot, maybe one of the best, very good pilot, but you also have a talent. You can start new topics with you. Yannick, do you, would you want to discover the history of the art cars in pictures? Absolutely, of course. OK, well, let's watch it then. Well, let's just um, you now watch the pictures and film about the, um, the way in which the art cars have uh, de developed over the uh, 24 hours of Le Mans. It's a great history in the 24 hours of Le Mans.
Voilà les art cars, les œuvres d'art. That said, the art cars, the quickest works of art on earth. Now we raced in Le Mans uh, with two people in the car up until the middle of the 1980s. Is that right, Marcel? Then we moved on to three. Yannick was more or knew this period more. Now let's move on to the current period with a third um, teammate with you, who's good, Hervé Poulain. Unfortunately, he's not with us, but we were able to record his words. Hervé Poulain took part 10 times in the 24 Heures du Mans. He often brought the cars back to um, where they set out from, and let's um, talk to him. We asked him from Greece, where he is at the moment, to actually talk to us. He's on really good form, but he has um, start with this dual sort of discussion with Hervé Poulain. Bonsoir euh, Hervé Poulain, merci de, de nous Hervé avoir Poulain. accordé un peu Thank de votre temps. Alors vous êtes en quasiment en termes de la vie, you. et nous, nous sommes au Mans. Qu'est-ce que cela so qu -ce que so évoque pour vous Est-ce qu'on peut trouver un raccourci en fait C'est une longue distance qui le mettait plus, c'est pas un long nombre de miles, un long nombre de miles qui nous séparent. Yes, the great heat. Uh, I'm in the Cucladis and the Cycladis on an island called Parios, and it's very well known because in antiquity, the, one of the trees was coveted by all of the um, main sculptors, Phidias, and uh, there's also marble from Paros. The, there's the victory of Samothrace, which was built, and the Venus of Milo. They were built with this marble from Paros. So it introduces a conversation on art. What do you think? Absolutely. All of this is going to lift us closer and closer to the 24 Heures du Mans. Absolutely. I would just like to say hello to all of you, to the um, director, or president, uh, two other guests who are not just great pilots, but they're also great men. They have deep human qualities. And so I wanted to say this to start with. And I would like to also say hello and salute the audience. I'm very, very frustrated to not meet them and see them, but that's the way things are. I hope that they share my frustration. Well, actually, they do. You can tell. Okay. If there are any questions, please ask me questions. Otherwise, that's it. Okay. Easy question. Uh, painting cars and painting contemporary art onto these cars. Was this a mad uh, idea or a genius idea? It's a handsome, uh, fantastic episode in 24 Hours of Le Mans. Hervé. And also in the history of art. I used to drive rally, rally races. My brother started on R8 Gordini, then Alpines, I, and then uh, the Holy Grail for me were, of course, the 24 hours of Le Mans in my Alpine. And as a gentleman driver, I had no access, no power to access this level of driving and uh, racing. So I had to find an idea, and I found it quite easily, actually, through the job I did. And through what I loved, I would love speed and beauty. That guided my life. I wanted to give a dimension of movement, action to my life as an auctioneer and a lover of art. And I wanted to have, um, and I used to go to the races, and I used to race to get this. And I always said that if Rimbaud had known the automobile uh, racing, <laughs> then he would have absolutely um, adored it and art and the one of industry which were totally separate and today there's no handbag that Bernardo Arnaud doesn't ask an artist uh, to sign as theirs, but it was something very different in those days. And this, and I'm very proud of this, I wanted to make a present to the audience of the Le Mans, of the 24 hours, 24 hour races, because they weren't necessarily uh, people who were close to the world of contemporary art and or art, and they thought that maybe that this was a completely different world that they weren't actually invited to. And I wanted to show them that contemporary art is accessible to everyone. 
and that is made for everyone. And of course, the, cal ca the first artist I uh, hired for this uh, Calvest work was very much um, good for this. Flat colors, yellow, blue, red. It, it's like taking it out of a drawing book, from a, a child's drawing book. And it was very quickly um, something that created some, some form of emotion. And secondly, Calvert is the sculptor who invented movement in sculpture, and as a result, he was very much perfect for this. And third advantage, he lived in Secli and Touraine, and six months of the year, he was in the United States. And so that's why I thought of him right at the beginning. And then the problem would have then been to find a manufacturer that would understand uh, the ambition behind my project after a few failures. And one day I was in the street and I uh, met up with Jean Todd, whose where destiny had not yet been traced. He was a rally uh, racing navigator and he said only some, there's only one person who can understand your projects, and that's uh, Patch in BMW. Uh, BMW. So I, I had this amazing chance to find a partner on the phone. He first of all said, but we don't have it any cars, because we only race in the United States this year with Brian Redman and, Sa and San Posey and Peter Gregg, and we don't have any cars. And then he called me back and said, OK, we'll make one. And so that's, we'll produce one. That's how I started. Extraordinary. And footballers today, when they kick a goal, oh, they cross the pitch on their knees to show that they're really happy. And I remember this. I had a huge, great corridor, and I slid along the corridor on my knees as if I'd scored the goal for the World Cup. OK, Arno, we could spend hours and hours with you. Okay, sorry. Um, there's this famous sentence uh, that says, choosing is renouncing. We won't be able to spend that much time on the phone here with you. But actually, choosing is giving up or renouncing. If you were to remember just one of these or keep one of these cars, would it be the first one, the, the one that finished the best placed? Would it be maybe the one that's the most in the media? Which one? How can you choose between your daughters? How would you do that, eh? You'll, you love all of them. Well, it's the same for me. They all have their own character, their own specificities. They Each one of them have their own history. And of course, they're the legitimate daughters. They're my legitimate daughters. Then, of course, they were the babies inspired from this, but ones that came from this. But these are girls that I drove. And I'd like to salute Marcel Mignot. Dear Marcel, he's going to tell you the story about Liechtenstein and the race that we did in Dante's conditions under floods of rain. He's going to tell you about this. And then my friend Dalmas is a hero three times, four times to Le Mans. It's fantastic. It's just ridiculous. It's actually disgusting. It's disgusting. And, well, before we finish, because... Maybe the Cal heard, because it won the appraisal of the public. The project that I had to show the public that art is not just for an elite that might have a special type of education, that art is for everyone. Art is for everyone, for everyone. That's right. And the Calvert fulfilled really well this purpose. And I remember when we used to go in front of the tribunes, uh, everyone used to stand up, and it was fantastic, fantastic. People really, really loved this project, and it created, they, then they moved on to the next one. It was a major, major success. Fantastic, Hervé. Just to finish off very quickly, we know... Uh, the auctioneer, very well known, very professional, the art amateur who raced in the event Get Hard Dumont. I would like to finish off with a quick look at the uh, driver. We might even forget about the fact that you've done this listening to you and lis listening to your story, but Hervé Poulon, Poulon is also a very good pilot. You were brilliant at the event Get Hard Dumont. Many times you brought the cars back to the finishing line, and my question is very simple. What was your favorite time at Le Mans and your favorite place? on the track? What was your favorite place on the track? 
Well, of course, there's the starting block or the starting line. Each time I had the feeling that I was, uh, I was achieving the dream of millions of young men, and I thought, make the most of it. Millions of young men would be there, like to be there in your place. And then there's the arrival of the finish line. Finishing the 24 hours is a victory in itself, and so it happened to me on various occasions. This sort of uh, amazing. Uh, serene feeling going across the finish line. It's extraordinary. And then, of course, uh, there's also the uh, the event during the mistakes, the, the, when you spin around, and it's not your life doesn't go in front of your eyes. It's the disaster with the race and the mechanics and engineers who no longer see you driving past. I've, it didn't happen to me to break a car at Le Mans, but it can be a tragedy. If you don't mind, um, there's a film in the exhibition, and this film or video, it shows the, t the f when the Caesar um, sort of f f f um, spins around. It was a very provocative, absolutely very provocative. And all I can say about this is that, you know, a gentleman driver uh, it's very subservient. A pilot such as Yannick Delmas, who comes off the track, well, th well, that's uh, you know because that happens. But an amateur, they've underestimated things. And this is this spin around is something that should be shown to, in all schools. The uh, track was wet. I uh, f spun around, and then straight away you saw that I braked and helped with the turning with the steering wheel, and I started. Uh, spinning and I knew that I was going to stop uh, and be in the opposite direction of the race and I lifted my foot off so from the brake so that the car carry on for a lap and go or spin around again and go right right, right back round to the uh, right position that's something that should be shown in all schools and it's on this very uh, vanitous or vanity um, filled um, comment that I'm an heroic comment that I'm going to finish I would like to congratulate you for this exhibition because it's been I, I've been watching your exhibitions for years with the American cars and so on. You have great ambitions for your museum. It's fantastic. And I really applaud this. Thank you very much, Elvi. And we really, really appreciate your comments, actually. All of the room uh, applauds you, salutes you, and we'll speak to you very soon, I hope, Elvi. Goodbye. So that was Hervé Poulain. Yannick, you know Hervé Poulain quite well, very well. Yes. I used I know him, Hervé, fairly well, very well. He's a fun, he's a del, delightful man. That's what I was saying to my colleague. He has a very great, generous heart. He's very joyful. He's very uh, well. He's very well read and uh, and knows a lot of things. Uh, has a lot of general knowledge. We spending an evening with him is. Uh, wonderful. He's a gentleman who loves telling his stories, and um, he also loves sharing his stories. And I think that this is something when you talk about a topic without necessarily sharing it with his heart in his hand. And uh, this is what he does, and he's a fantastic man. Yes, he's a very much uh, a man who passes on history. Now, gentlemen, this uh, BMW, I apologize, Marcel, but Hervé promised us that you're going to tell us 1977, the Liechtenstein, and uh, this uh, uh, amazing race. What happened? Remember that you brought onto the finish line for the first time an art car uh, in ninth place, which was fun. very, very good. Yes, this um, participation with this 3B Group 5 of 1977 with the Schwarz engine, we were learning with the RV, uh, how to, we were testing it, and we were, uh, we thought, we didn't have uh, any, anything other than just bringing it over the finish line. And in respect with the other competitors, the, it was propelled by a two-liter engine. It was the engine that equipped the Team Junior uh, cars at the time. And it was prepared by Paul Roche, who was the great engineer from um, BMW. 
W Motorsports. And so we started the race, we began the race uh, quite normally, and um, during a relay, eight, nine o'clock in the evening, in the north, new uh, part, we had our eyes uh, flying around, looking around on the uh, different, uh, on the different uh, uh, pressure valves, and uh, the oil pressure was at zero. I stopped at the pit stop, the engineer, I talked to the engineer, he said, we'll carry on, see how far we go. And then I noticed um, that by uh, going up in the gears, the pressure also increased with the uh, increase when I put up, put the gear, uh, you know, increased the gears, uh, went up in the gears. And on the straight lines, in places where the engine actually normally stabilized, it dropped back down to zero. Uh, so we didn't really understand what was happening, but I just thought, well, maybe uh, there's uh, uh, something that has needs uh, um, uh, to be changed. So I dropped the engine um, regime to not tire the engine too much and down to 7,000 revs, uh, I think. So uh, 7,000 uh, is the maximum amount. And so I dropped down by 500. And with LV, we were participating in, well, there were two of us in this racing car. So I only had time to uh, give him uh, my impression on the car had a few seconds and tell him how the we were in a difficult situation and how I dropped the revs. And so we dropped the revs during the full race and then we compensated with steering, with uh, driving, because we didn't want to uh, be too delayed and too late. And the race uh, went into the night, there was some rain, there were a few problems. Uh, Hervé talked about them a little earlier on, but then we ended up in full in the early morning, and we were still uh, in sixth place. And Hervé is an excellent pilot. I need to underline this. I would like to underline this. And then there was the end of the race, and we could feel that the car was starting to be a bit more difficult to manage in terms of power. They found it difficult to pick up power, and so we finished. Uh, Luigi's went in uh, front of us again. They were behind us, and they are BMWs uh, with a Belgian team, I remember. They were um, coupes, and they were doing very well in, actually, in those days. They were very well appreciated, and we ended up ninth in the race. And then at the end of the year, during uh, an, um, an event by BMW in Munich, Paul Roche, the engineer, um, I talked to him, and he said, Marcel, you need to come to the workshop tomorrow. I have a surprise for you. And so I went to the workshop, and he gave me as a present a piston of the engine that had been in the Le Mans uh, race, and I still have it today. And he explained to me what he found when he took the engine uh, part. The, uh, the engine is in four, two parts, held by four claws, and one of the claws broke. And the luck that we had was that it didn't actually set the engine off uh, track. So this claw then hit an oil um, pipe at the bottom of the bottom of the uh, of the of the car. It's dry with pumps on each side, and this explained the fact that the pressure was dropping down to zero when the uh, uh, the uh, driving was stabilized in, on a straight line. And so it increased in pressure this oil when the car accelerated and when. I changed uh, gears. And so then the engine lasted throughout the race, and it was a miracle. And the um, two-liter engine is a very, very strong, I can tell you. BMW have done a really good job on that. The, the movement of the engine uh, pushed um, uh, bits of metal and this claw uh, from uh, the crankshaft uh, from 8 o'clock in the evening until the arrival, uh, the finish line. Uh, so that's the uh, great story behind this car. But you know, at the 24 Heures du Mans, there's always uh, some luck involved. And um, there are stories for all competitors. There are always some. And um, Roy Lichtenstein said the painting he did on this car was going to give you an advantage of five miles per hour, probably eight kilometers per hour, uh, more than others. I don't know if it was actually the case in reality. I'm sure that uh, the talisman on this car was the sun on this car, and it took up right to the daylight and to the finish line. And in fact, uh, the hour and sun are a common trait, for a common thread 
uh, in this uh, evening. Uh, now, you've been listening, is open to Yannick. What does it remind you of this memory of driving and piloting and of driving, uh, you know, waiting, uh, dropping the revs? And is this very different from what you've had to deal with? Yes, it's just different, actually. But Mar Marcel was saying and is that 24 hours can start and then they can stop after five minutes. Um, and then they can also last the whole race, so for 24 hours, with this small, um, this small um, part that was um, drop, uh, blocking the uh, the exit pipe for the oil and the camshaft. Um, and I was listening to him because if it was going to break, it breaks. And and of course, um, as you say the car, there was sun, and maybe there was a god there um, that meant that things had to finish and come to an end, and they had to cross the finish line. It's great, it's a small story, but uh, there are many stories that, such as this one. And by uh, being uh, careful of your of their car, they were able to drive it as far as possible, and as long for as long as possible, so it's great, really. It shows how strong the BMW engines are. First of all, uh, the brand was an engine producer, that's a manufacturer. Was it a pride for you to uh, to run, to race for BMW? Is it, was it unusual? Was it very special for you, especially at Le Mans? Yes, of course, especially since the... Uh, um, um, we took part. Manfredin Pilok was the older brother of the one who uh, drove with us in our victory car on the in the BMW. And for this past first participation with and uh, decorated by Andy Warhol, you saw this on the film earlier on. We ended up sixth in the general uh, classification, but it was also a very difficult race. We stopped and ended up for the whole beginning of the race, even during the, into the night in the uh, 10 first in eighth position. And then during the night, there was a mechanical problem. We had to stop for more than an hour at the pit stop. So uh, on the listing or classification, uh, the you know, uh, we were, we were it was a disaster for us. We were really sad. And I took over after this repair. And then the rain started flooding on the track, everyone was stopped, and it was a real deluge. We couldn't see ahead of us. The sun was coming up, thankfully, and um, we could only see through the uh, windows of the, or the mirrors on the sides of the doors because the wing, the uh, front mirror, and the windscreen wipers didn't were useless. Even the cars that we were catching up with that were ahead of us. Um, um, we couldn't actually see them that well or notice them. Even the uh, red, uh, the red color was masked by the water um, spraying up. It was a, th a three liter, 3.5 liter car. It was an atmospheric engine, and so I had an advantage on the engine, the cars with compressed turbo engines and prototypes that were far lighter. So this car had more stability in on the water with the weight, and it was also very well designed. It was stable, and it really stuck um, and was stable on the road, on the bends, and it was remarkable, actually. So I remembered how one had to drive on rainy tracks, on wet tracks, of course, and in rain you have to be careful when you're catching up other competitor, with other competitors to not actually hit them because that's happened, you know, at the end of a straight line, uh, just before the bump. Michel Leclerc, I think, was racing in a Ferrari. And, and he had arrived a bit too quickly uh, with his car, and he had hit another car that was slower and having problems in the water. Um, and so we had to really be very, very cautious. After a while, I remembered that if we can talk about, uh, about driving, yes, we don't realize, but we're listening to your memory, and we have the impression that we're in the the, the driving school. We're trying listening to you, I'm trying to understand the techniques. So I always analyze steering and driving, sorry. Um, after a while, I remember that 
to go fast, you need to take time to do it. That's a comment that I remember. And what does that mean? Well, I'll explain to you. Uh, uh, Steering Moss on the rifle. Jackie Stewart, no, sorry. Grand Prix in Germany, uh, the Grand Prix. He said this. Uh, he said that he had won, he won the Grand Prix in a fantastic way, in rain and fog. And he said the following. He said, on wet uh, tracks in the rain, you have it's easy. You have to take your time to go fast. So he had said something really important. In places where uh, you're slow, you have a tendency to want to go too fast. And since there's no uh, adherence onto the road, that's where you make the most mistakes, no grip. Otherwise, uh, on you can have there's no adherence, sufficient adherence, even if you can, and you can lose a great deal of time in places where things are slow and delay a re-acceleration re for the following straight line. And that's uh, where you make mistakes, and especially where you have to go fast and the main um, uh, bends, you have to go for it and you have to go ahead. And I remember what, before I used to go and uh, pilot in Le Mans, I used to go in the small curve in between Mutsan and Arnaz. And in the first one, no problem. The second one, there's a big bump. I went at full speed. Um, you have to be careful, of course. Yannick will agree with me. And in, in the rain, I remember uh, having seen that those uh, watching those who went at full speed and those who lifted uh, their foot off the accelerator. And in the Inodier, um curve as well, bend. What speed is that? For, uh, for speed lovers. Well, before the chicanes, it was at full speed without lifting your foot, whatever the type of car. So 300, 360. I remember having gone at this speed. It was uh, very, very quick on wet track with the AM1. Uh, I went at full speed in Mulsanne on the most, uh, the biggest curves. So that's over 300 kilometers per hour with the AM1. Well, almost anyway. And um, on when you brake and the stability was quite good, the car was stable. I stopped at the pit stop for uh, to, to get more fuel, and the engineer said things are not going too badly. We're going up in the uh, we're, we're 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 going up in the head in the listing. Do you want to carry on? And I said okay. I'll, I had a drink. I had something to eat, and I set off again. And of course. Speed and time were far less substantial because of the um, rain, and the remaining hours, uh, the next four hours, went by, and I gained four places in four hours. I was 14th, and I brought the car back up to uh, eighth place. And then Montrain took over the uh, steering, the piloting, and he finished. And then he picked up two, two, two more places and went ahead two more places. And we ended up number six. And that's more than an hour, an hour at the pit stop for the repairs uh, during the night. So do you regret these repairs? Well, that's the race, isn't it? And I think that for the first participation of this car, it was not bad, but we could have even ended up doing better. So, Marcel, you've answered in another way this question of the pleasure of us piloting and the pride of driving a PMW. And you've talked about the sensations of uh, driving this incredible car. It's an extraordinary car, the M1, and uh, fantastic. And what you didn't say is that Winkelock, Manfred Winkelock, was a pilot from the plant. And it, might say, it seems to me that this small guy from the Le Mans, the pilot's instructor, was quicker than the guy who came from the plant. And sometimes Sometimes it's uh, good to say this, and it shows and testifies to how much talent you have. Now, coming back to Yannick for uh, how proud he is, um, you know, driving for BMW. Now, to remind you of things, let's watch these few um, uh, this uh, short video. Thank you.
Yannick. Yannick, uh, driving for BMW at the 24 hours. Well, it was a real pride for a um, racing driver to drive, to drive for a manufacturer, for this manufacturer. I was able to work with various manufacturers and able to win as well. And if, I, well, these are feelings that um, are slightly difficult to explain. But what was really beautiful with BMW, the car, when it appeared, we went around the track the first few times on RRS uh, in Spain, in RRS, and uh, there were quite a lot of things to find to tune and adjust. And the reality with manufacturers is that they are very reactive. And what's great is that when there are small things that need to be improved, well, you don't wait for three months, three weeks or a month. It happens within two days. A part arrives by airplane and, and it, this then can be retested. It's, it's really great. And with BMW, of course, the car was quite unusual because it was open, topped. It was open, as opposed to other cars. It was open, as opposed to faced with other cars. We had a problem also with the light lighting. There was not enough. BMW had added a third light in the middle of the bonnet, a bit like in 39, the 328. Absolutely. It was the fourth victory with BMW, so it's great. And why? Um, I'm not hesitating, but with the McLaren, there was the engine, the V12 NG with the wonderful sound. It's a BMW engine. It's BMW was first an engine producer for aviation, and then motorcycles, and then autom automotive, automobiles, cars. So I think yeah, you really, really liked the McLaren, didn't you? Yes, well, with the McLaren and the engine that was really good, we had this coupling that was, um, that was phenomenal, the power was very high, the car on the straight line was flying, really. Uh, we were quicker than the prototypes, just to tell you how fast we are. And then on, when we braked, we braked 150 meters or 200 meters before because we didn't have the aerodynamic supports. And so it was quite uh, tricky to, um, to, to drive, but the engine was fabulous. And now why with BMW? Well, because it's quite specific with the same engine that has been improved um, was, was uh, actually um, put into the prototype, um, assembled into the prototype, so we knew it. That's why it's specific, quite unusual, because with BMW, it's a victory and a half with the engine. And that's it. What can I else can I say? Yeah, Nick, 1999, it's not all, uh, isn't it, it's not the best year of, uh, it's not a good year of the 24 hours of Le Mans, it's the best year, one of the, it's an exceptional year, many of you probably remember it, 17 cars uh, could have had access to the podium, Toyota, Mercedes, Nissan, Audi, with two different teams, BMW, Bonos, uh, of course, you mustn't forget get them with their roadsters, so the princes were hard to go by. I mean, at the time, there were pre-qualifications. What happened for Yannick Delmas at the pre-qualification uh, tests of Le Mans in 1999? Well, there are pre-qualification qualifications, TSD, now, and at that time, yes, you were playing your life on the knife's edge with the uh, time with the timer the pre-qualifications unfortunately for me were not fantastic because i set off and we were out so we said this is technical so you go round, you do one lap then you in you go in front of the stand uh, the uh, the time uh, timer starts and then you go back again uh, come back again and it stops and then it was my turn to come back and between Milan and Indianapolis, it was uh, slightly, I was slightly decelerating, but it was 338 kilometers per hour. And then the uh, back, uh, back part of the car broke, 
the, uh, the wing, the back wing broke, and so uh, I uh, did 15 sort of uh, uh, spins without touching the side rails. Uh, with, it was a miracle, same as Hervé Poulain, absolutely. Um, and then, but I broke a rib because it was so violent. Um, the movement of the car spinning that uh, one of my ribs broke. So the car was really rolling uh, for the afternoon in the trials, but the engineers didn't want to um, get the car to roll again straight away um, because they wanted to uh, analyze the breaking of the wing. So the pre-qualifications were not that long for as far as I was concerned, and I don't really have a fantastic memory of it. Good memory. Okay, not great memory, but two things to remember from this very private story. Well, the car doesn't come back out, and BMW brought three cars to the pre qualifications, and the art car that's in the museum at the moment that was decorated by Jenny Holzer, the um, woman, women, female artist, the What I Want us artist on the car. Well, it rolled a lot during the pre qualifications. It then doesn't roll on the track during the race, the actual race, but a quick comment. You go out, you go, you do a lap, um, then it qualifies the car. It doesn't put it in danger for this game, the half second that meant that you came out or you stayed in the race. And um, I think this uh, time uh, was in the, or the time was in the top three of this famous days of qualifications. And there's another memory of 1999 that I'd like to actually talk about with you. And that was 20 years ago. It wasn't that long ago, 20 years ago, Yannick. And then, of course, I can talk about it now. It's a long time ago. It's a picture we wanted to keep you, you get, give you and let you keep stay with. Uh, there's this image in the stand, a face to face with Gerhard Berger and Yannick Delmas between the team manager and the uh, driver. And I was told that, or the pilot, and I was told that a legend had told me that Yannick Delmas had actually stood up and, um, and not really uh, to what he wanted and not really followed the uh, instructions of the boss. And actually, with his experience of the 24 hours of Le Mans, he wanted to bring the car where he wanted it to, to the first place. And he brought it to the first place. So there, was there really a discussion between Gerhard Berger and Yannick Delmas in 1999? Is that true? Well, it was 20 years ago now, so I can talk about it, but um, I've never liked this type of dis debate. In a racing team or a team, either you win or you lose together, and I think that the management at the time by Berger was, you know, you started uh, there was the general brief uh, briefing of the team before the race, and then you start and it's flat out and full on, on maximum alert. And I was, it was a question because a race of 24 hours uh, starting uh, or the way he had said, I think we would have broken the car. And so with my co-pilot, Pierre-Roger Martini and Joachim Wichelog, we said, okay, we're not going to do this. I told them this, and in the uh, structure of the, um, the uh, and thread of the race, we started, and then double relay, triple relay, then it was Pierre Luigi, and then Joachim, and I started at um, a high speed, but with a small margin to actually, you know, be care for the car. It means not taking vibrations, not. Um, Especially with the vibrators, uh, not press, pushing them and managing the gearbox, because that that's going to really be good for the pilot and structure, isn't it? What you're saying is at the time we didn't have the pallets on the uh, wheel. We had sequential uh, boxes. We could leave the four on f foot on the floor and uh, pass the gears, but uh, we used it for. Um, the choke and uh, and braking, but the pallets now on the uh, on the wheel, you know, have no risk of over uh, revving uh, when you go up or down. These are details, but they have an importance for the 24 hours. And so we were very very careful of this throughout a great part of the race. And what was difficult, that's why BMW, as far as I'm concerned, is well. I was very happy to win f in for BMW and. Uh, I was also um, quite frustrated by the tension that lasted for 24 hours with Berger. 
and in my relay races by, over the radio, it was always push, push, push. And I used to say, I don't want to push. I don't want to push the car. And when I said I don't want to push, it doesn't mean that we were at, we were two seconds from the other car. Um, there were maybe three and five tenths, six tenths of a second. But we were always there. We were being careful. And at that stage, our car, well, one of the specificities was that BMW had done this amazing work on fantastic work on consumption and we were able to do one extra lap on the others and depending on the relays as we carried them out well we would do one extra relay on a race of 24 hours if you can do one extra lap it's really really good so throughout the race I tried to do this and at some point Pierre Luigi said well when am I going to be able to push when am I going to be able to push and I said well Pierre Pierre you're going to push but at some point you'll have to attack and go for it strong on Toyota and at some point during the race uh, it was his turn Toyota had come back they were at 30 seconds behind us and Pierre Luigi uh, put his foot on the floor he uh, was less careful about the car we'd done it for 18 or 20 hours and at that point at the same time Toyota took off as well uh, very strongly and they had a lot of uh, vibration and then they had a flat tire from 30 seconds we were went from one lap um, we had one lap ahead we were one lap ahead because of this um, flat tire and our strategy I think really paid off more than theirs and that's why either you win or you lose um, sometimes the pilot I would say well yes um, I was the leader in my team with the other pilots because in the number of participations in 24 Heures and the victories I had more on my track record than my co-pilots but we built this race and during the uh, test drives and the trials and during the race we did it with three pilots we raised it with three pilots so we had to communicate a lot among ourselves on small things on the track uh, things that happen on the track there are positive aspects negative aspects and I think that at some point you need to talk a lot so that the three pilots do not have this disadvantage on the on one of the other pilots and so during the race and this is why the 24 hours of Le Mans really are a, a very is very really is a very unusual race and I'm quite lengthy and I'm just trying to explain uh, that it's three pilots at the time it was uh, before it was two it was probably very difficult having just two pilots two drivers but uh, the, here the pilots uh, are in uh, rivaling each other um, there's a rivalry and I think that for a race such as this one at some point you put your ego push your ego aside and um, and it really is winning at three it's not who's going to be doing it maybe there's a leader he's going to at some point with Berger and I said don't listen do it this way and you'll see it'll work and it wasn't just Berger at the time the manager was Charlie Lam, Charlie Lam and Charlie Lam used to, came to see me and he asked questions and he said listen I said listen Charlie you won many times the 24 heures uh, and you men uh, for different races. Le Mans, you don't know. You've never won Le 24 Heures du Mans and uh, the 24 Hours. And trust me, you'll see that if we are careful about the mechanical aspects, we'll end up with something very beautiful. So it's not six hours or three hours. It's 24 hours, this race. It's always been the way we've done things with my co-pilots and the engineer. And when I had, I had my engineer at the time and he supported me because it was with the engineer that we had won the 24 Hours of Le Mans with the McLaren. And so our strategy, um, I had the approval and support of his approval and support. So we both had strong pressure from our bosses and the support from the engineers and the mechanics who could see how things were happening. So that was it. It was comforting and uh, along these lines, it's very important to, um, for me to push this subject. I'm not um, trying to sing my praises. I'd been hired by BMW. It was to carry out a mission to try to win the race, and so we were knowing no more, no less than our job as pilots, and we're 
I have a, we have a privileged position as pilots. I was doing my job as a pilot, and at some point, unfortunately, and this is the first time in my career, I did not abide by the advice and rules that my boss was giving me because I didn't think at that point that it was the right way to do things. And in the end, during the race, our car had a technical problem. The anti-rust bar broke. I think DG Leto um, uh, came out from where they abandoned. And then all of the look, all of the people, everyone was watching our car. And then things went well. And at some point, Pierre Louis Julie Martini had uh, qualified the car. Uh, he loved uh, putting, you know, getting it through the qualifications, um, qualification races, and it was up to his him to go fast and show that we weren't slow. That's it, Yannick. Okay, so we can see how the official cars have dri been driven. Now the second one that abandoned, there was a young Danish uh, pilot, Tom Christensen. He's now the record man. Uh, for v victories in the world. Why did Yannick Danmas actually stop at four? Well, I stopped because I thought that there was, uh, I was becoming a tiny bit um, blasé about it. So maybe, I said, well, I stopped in 2002, and I'm saying maybe because there were fewer manufacturers than there are today. You'd found your first love with De Genac and Ricard. Yes. The program was that I started with Curia Ricard in Formula Renault 3, and then we set, went our own uh, separate ways, then Formula 1, 41 Grand Prix. So these are small teams, don't worry, uh, it doesn't matter if you got that figure wrong. And so I did part of my uh, career with endurance drivers to different manufacturers and the newspapers when they get in touch they say okay we have a project at the time it was the price of the project and it was a project over three years and they said would you would you like to join our forces and I'd started with Eureka and I started I ended up with the Eureka team and the loop was looped unfortunately the project uh, actually collapsed because in 2001 you know that there were uh, attacks, uh, terrorist attacks in the United States, and the project actually did not end up being carried out. And that was it. It was time to stop, I think, and provide more uh, input into the race with the role that you actually hold today. We're coming towards the finish line. It's the uh, new media structure. Well, it'd be good if you talk to each other. I'll give you the questions. You can ask the questions to each other. Quite a standard way. Your favorite moment in the Guest Hall du Mont and the place that you love. You're both very, very good pilots. What's your favorite place on the track? And then you can talk to both of you together, and I'll take a step back. Yannick, you've just showed us that the race is this race is a team sport. You never do anything on your own, and uh, it takes. You know, relying on your the people who work with the car, your co-pilots, you need to rely on them. And you talked about the how important it is to prepare for the uh, event and have this operating structure that's established depending on uh, the adversity that's available in the uh, during the race. It's always moved and changed. Uh, you have a table, but it's never something we stick to, of course. It's adapted. You need to stick, OK? So you need to hold. And before uh, anything, you need to ensure that it's the car stops for as little time as possible at the pit stop. And the best uh, class, uh, class uh, the best, uh, the ones that have the best classification are the ones that have the minimum amount of time at the pit stop. And they impose themselves in the race. And they have the best place. Um, so you need a good team in the car. When you have a factory team, you have the best, um, and everything is organized for the best. And uh, true, just to go uh, and end up on the finish line, there can't be any uh, competition between the pilots or the team. You need to put your, push your ego aside. It's not doing the best time for you or being quicker than the other person. You go you know, at your pace, at your rhythm, and things happen. Thus, the best place, I don't know. Um, I raced the circuit, the track was different from what it is today, what it was and what it is. 
the asses in the alum curb or, or bend didn't exist. I went full speed over the bump at the top. I remember with cars that were quicker having this feeling that it was taking off and then braking at uh, the Red Cross and then on the right lay on the on the straight line they weren't the chicanes, the two chicanes. And the Inudia curve, as I was saying, we used to zoom across it at full speed, all of the cars on would slide on the wet track after a while and braking was uh, impress impressive at Mulsan. And very strong braking. But I have a small preference for the part between Mutsan and Indianapolis and Arnaj. Um, this has not changed. It's remained the way it was, very quick. So first, you arrive as quickly almost as when you're on the straight line before the first straight line in Indianapolis. And I remember that you couldn't get this wrong because there were some little drops at the drop at the edge of the track. It wasn't all uh, all sort of uh, all, all sort of protected as now. Even if you went into it very fast, the car couldn't slide or slip away from you. Of course, the new part is very interesting from a technical point of view. There's the Porsche uh, um, bend and then the uh, sequence that follows, and it forces a great deal of attention, especially when the race is on arrives at the Sunday morning and people are tired. Um, so it's very something you have to be very, very careful of, especially uh, there are different grips that can, uh, different types of grips. So yes, there's this um, part between Mutsan and Arnaz, this portion of the track, and that's where Yannick is going to take over. And as we're saying, the professor isn't, or well, the teacher isn't Alain Prost, it's, it's, uh, it's Marcel Mignot. Marcel, we would like to ask you what your place is, your favorite place is on the uh, Yannick. Could you, Yannick, could you ask him what his favorite place is? Now, the moments I prefer at the 24 hours are right early in the morning, from 4 o'clock in the morning, at the, uh, when the sun starts um, starts showing, and you may have noticed this, from Mulsanne to Indianapolis, uh, and it's at nightfall, that's the period that I liked the least from Mulsanne to Indianapolis because of the sun, which is horizontal on the horizon, and whatever your visor or your, uh, your, your the, the color of the uh, wind, of the uh, wing mirror, of the uh, shield, the wind, uh, whatever the type of strips you have, or hat you have, or cap you have, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible. And often we used to pilot with one hand because we used to hold uh, our hand in front of our eyes to shield our eyes from the sun. And so this was the period that I liked the least, but we needed to uh, suit, uh, fit to it and adapt to it. And what I really enjoyed was the morning time at the at sunrise. Why? Because the air was a bit cooler. I'm a morning person, so that's why I really felt good. The uh, engines work well. The pneumatics, uh, the tires are very good. There's a sort of um, sort of film of uh, rubber all over throughout the night that's deposited on it. The uh, lap times are great without really destroying the car because everything uh, rolls easily and. That's it, really. It's a moment that I really enjoy. And just a little story about this. In the evening, Le Mans, we never talk about it. But when we uh, arrive at Delop, and then we do the S's, go through on the S bends, and then the Tertre Rouge, there are these smells of barbecues gr grilling or being grilled, and it makes you smile. But every lap, I can tell you this, every lap, when it was an open car, an open top car, I used to smell it less. But when it was closed, the car, in the inside of the car, I could smell the margueses, so the spicy sausages and the sausages, and it really was fun. It was a few seconds only, but it was just so odd. It was so unusual and odd at this place. Every lap, you could... He thought, oh, you know, we're going to have a little sort of nibble to eat. It was really fun. It was quite amusing. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, just as we were, uh, I just wanted to make this comment. We were listening to what you were saying, and I was thinking, and Manfred Linkelock and Joachim Winkelock are uh, something that link you, aren't they? They're brothers. They're brothers. Manfred was the older brother. So Manfred was a 
really delightful boy, and I have this wonderful memory of him. So sixth uh, place together, and Yannick with Joachim, Joachim, victory. Yes. Okay, so maybe we can have four or five questions, four or five questions from the floor. Some of you, maybe you would like to talk about BMW, Yannick Delmas, or Marcel Mignot, any of you? Go for it. Alors, une première question de M. Christian Monchartre du Mans dans la Sarthe. One first question from Mr. Christian Monchartre from Le Mans in the department of Sarthe. Oui, j'avais une question. I have a question to Yannick. Il a quatre victoires. Four victories. Quelle serait pour lui, quelle est la plus belle Which is the most beautiful, handsome one of your victories, handsome of your victories Question qui est It's a trick question. C'est difficile de répondre. Well, it's difficult to answer. Because. Alors, juste une petite chose. Je veux pas être long, mais. I don't want to be too lengthy about this, but as far as I'm concerned, the 24 hours races. I used to watch it on the television and read about it in the newspapers. And Le Mans. Uh, how, how can I say this? Le Mans was something else, different from what I had planned to do in my career. Uh, which was Formula One. And when I I moved on to endurance and we came to the 24-hour track with the Peugeot 905 in 1991, when I arrived here, I can tell you that I was concentrated. We, it was the World Championships and the 24 hours of Le Mans were part of the World Championships. And when I arrived in Le Mans on the track, I was... Um, petrified. I, it's not that I'd lost an, my abilities, but it was really impressive. We really felt tiny, tiny, tiny because it was huge and we, the, the length of the circuit of the track that wasn't permanent, the pit stops or the stands that were, no, the stands that were ancient in the first year I was there. I was there. So the seating area, right? it was right at the beginning. They were just changing it. And uh, Pierre, I think that's right, isn't it? And then this track, uh, to really get to know it, well, it's pretty much impossible. You have a feeling about it, and I'm going to then answer your question about the four victories. But you have a feel for it. You take a great deal of pleasure. And it's a lot, a lot of concentration. And with the Peugeot in the first year, it was six hours, and we gave up. Secondly, second one was with Peugeot, and that was an exceptional moment because it was during the World Championships. It was for a French um, team, and my boss, Jean Todd, was very complicated. It was difficult, but complicated. I had a co-pilot, Eric Grogwig, uh, who was fantastic and extraordinary throughout the year. Sometimes Derek quali uh, qualified the cars for the race. Sometimes I did. So Derek, um, w when I had this um, uh, this agreement and uh, relationship that was fantastic, and then with Peugeot, it was human situation, technical situation. We were in a French team big team and the whole environment that made it um, and turned into my first victory. And when you're there uh, up on with the winners and you see the crowd of people, it's very impressive. But uh, what was beautiful was that the work that we had asked to uh, do, the work, the uh, job we had asked to do, the mission was something we would accomplished together with my co-teammates and the whole team and co-pilots. And I think that the first one, uh, of course, was very um, strong in emotion. The second victory, victory was with Porsche, and that was different. Um, because I'd sort of jumped on the bandwagon, really, and it was a good, beautiful victory, but, but it was such a privilege, it's such a privilege to win at Le Mans, so the uh, second one was, of course, very strong, and what I remember from the victory, our uh, victory was, and each time, was the work and involvement of the other people in the team who 
made this victory or this race stronger and ever stronger. And 1994, from a human point of view, would got done well, but it wasn't an exceptional. Um, it wasn't exceptional. Nothing negative, but we had gotten well with the whole team, but it wasn't exceptional. Now, the third victory, McLaren, well, between the weather conditions that were awful, um, a small team, the car was a car that came from McLaren's team plant. It was managed by a private team, Lanzan, the Lanzan team. And the situation in the third race was the weather. My co-pilot, Digi Ditto, with whom we got on perfectly well, and Masson Wells, Sekia, with Sekia, the Japanese pilot, to go about it. Every time we talked together, there was an interpreter. So um, to explain what was going on and translate, so it was a bit more tricky. We have fantastic memories. We shared the same motor room with the same um, car with three people. We lived for 24 hours together. Uh, we crossed over, depending on the relays. And then the small team, the team manager, the people from BMW, from McLaren, a car that right in the beginning was not a favorite, despite the number of McLarens that were in this race. I think that from an emotional point of view, the track conditions were so difficult that 1995, for me, I think will 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 be remembered by myself uh, for a long, long time, for many, many years. And the most beautiful victory from a sporting point of view and how difficult it was, 1995, I think, is probably going to be my favorite, will stay, remain my favorite. And then uh, uh, from a sporting point of view, the fourth race was probably uh, the one that I would remember. But I'm saying this this evening, but... Um, some events struck me, and saying that one is more beautiful or better than another, well, it's difficult, actually, because uh, it's a great privilege to be able to win a race. That's the first thing. And this race, 24 hours, and I think that Le Mans, I ended up, I'm sorry, I'm being quite lengthy. No, it's very good, Yannick. We talked about this during the last 24 hours of Le Mans. I think that Le Mans at some point has to choose its winners because we can put all our assets on our side and do everything you want. We saw this in previous years, at the last moment when a Toyota breaks down on the last lap. I think somehow Le Mans chooses its winners. And at, in life, at some point, um, you're there, and Le Mans says, OK, we're going to help him once, twice, three times, four times, and that's it. Don't know. In any case, I think that as a former pilot, that we need to remain humble in Le, at Le Mans in a way that we don't have on, on our track uh, because there are so many problems day, night. Um, traffic, we didn't talk about it this evening. Uh, gaps, speed gaps between the different cars. Um, that's it. I apologize. Fabrice, but this evening I'm very happy to be here this evening and to be able to talk to you and share with you um, our history of uh, racing at Les 24 Heures du Mans. And if I'm talking about it in this way this evening, it's because I'm lucky today in the position I'm in to be able to see the flip side of the situation. When you're a player, you are in charge and dealing with the people that you work with in your team, in your um, in your 
group and everything around is something you never account for or look at because you're focused so much on your targets because you don't know what else is, is going on here in the uh, ACO in Le Mans. And that's why it's been the seventh year that I've been doing this job now and in this position. And this is why um, this is um, this evening. There's been the race and the whole work. Um, that's been set up and is fantastic for the 24 hours. Um, and being, if we, as a pilot, if we were to know the whole engine that uh, is uh, there with us, um, helping us before we actually go onto the track, I don't think we'd be able to succeed in doing it. We wouldn't be able to do it because we'd be, uh, there'd be so many things in our minds uh, blocking our thoughts um, we, that we wouldn't concentrate as much and we wouldn't be aware of what we have to do of, um, of our job as pilots and what I can see here today well, blimey, it's something that really uh, really, now I see what was done I, I really, it's really tough and having written a small chapter of these long years of the 24 hours of Le Mans, well I'm very humble about it and I'm very proud about it and I'm very happy Merci about it Merci Thank you Yannick Alors, on a eu un, Thank un you very much Now we've had a homogeneous pour, pour, pour team, pour now let's have a question now for Marcel Mignot Alors, uh, Marcel, vous avez fait, uh, Marcel you have got had beautiful mechanical cars rolling on the road in the 1970s, the art cars, BMW. Oh, I want to know what do you think about art cars, uh, contemporary ones, um, 20th, 21st century. There have been examples in this year, 2019. And are you disappointed to not have BMW renewing with this tradition in 2008 and also in 2019? Uh, I was lucky to be able to participate with BMW uh, on two fantastic cars, the Group 5 and the M1 um, car for the first participation, and then a third time with with the BMW by the Car de, Fran car de France, the BMW France car. I shared the, uh, the wheel with Didier Peroni and Didier Kester. Hervé, uh, example was followed uh, by other uh, competitors and brands um, in the years to follow. Um, and from time to time, you see cars that are decorated um, with a tendency to want to introduce something that the close to the idea that Hervé Poulain had had uh, on when he came up with the idea of uh, art cars. Today, we don't see any competitors bringing uh, works of art similar to the ones that we saw and knew in the 1970s and 1980s. Now, there are no longer any of these cars. Maybe in the car, in the future, these will happen and uh, manufacturers will take over. But BMW actually is carrying on uh, presenting cars and exhibiting them and showing them. And I have been very lucky. I was lucky to see uh, these cars in Paris at the BMW showroom, and there was a more recent car that was there as well. With it was decorated with contemporary art, very recent contemporary art. Now the story and history of Le Mans carries on, and I'm sure this idea will be carried on in a different way. Thank you very much, Hervé. Unfortunately, I think time is ticking by, and I'm going to ask. We are. We talked about the auctioneer, the quickest auctioneer on earth. I'm going to introduce the quickest uh, president or uh, director on earth, Pierre Fillon. He knows how to drive, and uh, he knows how to run things, and I think he also knows how to pilot a an M1 BMW on. The the uh, Le Mans circuit, a track, sorry. I don't know if Pierre, all of this is to do with being passionate about it, but please seat yourselves for a few seconds, uh, for a few seconds, but steering or piloting when you're passionate about the 24 Heures du Mans, piloting and driving an M1 on the track at the 24 Heures du Mans, what is it like? Yes, I was very lucky to be able to 
pilot this. I'm tiny in comparison to Yannick and Marcel, and I don't at all say pretend that I would uh, give you an example of my of my experience. But I did drive a, a three-liter CSL, then the M1 the following year, which is a car as Marcel said, which is ex exceptional. It uh, holds very well uh, on in the rain. You could, if you had, uh, it has nothing to envy to other from other cars, even if it had the gearbox on the wearing the steering wheel. And the best memory I have is at night in this car between Lucerne and India at That's my favorite uh, merci, memory. Pierre. Thank you, Pierre. Il est, il est it's now conclure, time to conclude. It was a sort of uh, a gift evening. So we're going to finish off with some gifts. I wanted here, yeah, Yannick, if I can get you to do this, just grab the uh, he headset that's below the table. No, the uh, this. Um, helmet. So these two gentlemen uh, came with presents for the ACO and the museum. Marcel brought his outfit and his racing hat for the 24 Heures du Mans. Marcel, um, you can, this helmet many times was in the 24 Heures du Mans. Pierre, this is for our museum. And Yannick brought along with him over there the uh, outfit in which he won the 24 Heures du Mans in 1999. I think you can give him a big round of applause. And they are going to be popped into the collection. La grande machine à histoire, so the history le collection, du Mans. the museum of the 24 Heures du Mans. And we couldn't let you leave without being able to hand you this symbolic gift. It's a tradition. It's the same thing every time we have a conference. Lisa worked on the exhibition a great deal. You can give Lisa a big round of applause. And she's bringing you this gift with all of the uh, encouragement and thanks from the heritage team. It's a lovely sort of symbolic uh, photograph or picture of Le Mans. It really does um, fit in very well with what you do. Now, Yannick, you may not see these very well, but Yannick is the victory of, of the car of victory, the V12 LMR, and Marcel's painting is actually quite nice because he's in his outfit as a pilot with the helmet, I think the one that's here, this helmet, and just above his head, if you turn it so the public can see or the audience can see it, it says um, steering or piloting school of the AOC and Joel Guimard is there as well so I'd like to uh, say hello to him as well so two very symbolic um, photographs for one and the other so thank you to these gentlemen Pierre, I'm going to leave you the floor now, you can conclude and you can say this yourself if you wish because you know about this now, maybe you can talk about uh, the next meeting and the next meet that will be at the museum during the next exhibition and the link that it will have with uh, the movies, with the cinema. A very beautiful film will be coming out soon in November. You will have the preview in Le Mans. You'll have a preview of it. Ten minutes of this film were screened. Uh, it's about 1966, the duel between Ford and Ferrari. And I cried for ten minutes. And I think you're all going to cry when you watch this film, which is fun, beautiful, and the exhibition in Le Mans will be on this topic, Le Mans 1966. Please come, please come in great numbers to the museum. Thank <laughs> you.